All right, we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm Thomas Mitchell. I'm an MDiv candidate at the Divinity School, but also Service Program Coordinator for the Civic and Moral Education Initiative, working with Carrie James. We co-convene CMEI, and our goal, and has been for 10 years now, is to kind of carry out the mission of presenting timely, relevant conversations on issues that center the intersection of civics, morality, and education. Um, it's from that mission that we developed this series on short conversations related to COVID-19. I think particularly as folks who have an interest in education policy and education law, or anything like that sort, I, I think there's a deep concern for many of us as we want COVID-19 means for the education sector from K through higher ed. And I think this conversation with um, Professor Gregory is vitally important based on Governor Baker's decision yesterday to close schools the remainder of the academic year for the state of Massachusetts. Um, before I introduce uh, Professor Gregory, I will note in the chat box there that you will see just a brief note that the session is being recorded. Um, if you don't want that to happen for you, um, you can change your name. If you like hover over um, your name in your video box, you can type a different name. You can also turn off your camera. Those are both valid options, but we would love for you to stay part of the conversation. Um, the next note is about technical difficulties. If you do encounter them, um, there's just a few notes there on how you can kind of remedy that situation. And if all else fails and you truly can't get back in the room because you've been booted out from a Wi-Fi issue or something like that, my email address is at the bottom of that note. Um, just let me know and I will do the best I can to kind of bring you back in. Um, Carrie and I throughout the conversation were kind of on the chat box, so I can feel free to use them. Um, but as far as anything else, that will be handed over to Professor Gregory. I'm going to introduce him briefly. He's a professor of law at the Education Law Clinic at Harvard Law School, and he also serves as the senior attorney for the Trauma and Learning Policy Initiative. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to him and let him lead the rest of the session. Thank you for being here, Professor Gregory. Great. Well, thank you so much for um, asking me to join you today, Thomas. I really appreciate it. And, and hi, everybody. Um, if you're like me, you've been spending most of your life on Zoom these days. And so the fact that um, you would add um, this conversation to the list of probably or the, the length of many hours you're already spending on Zoom is actually a big, a generous thing for you to do. And so I'm really um, glad to see you all here and um, looking forward to this conversation with you today. So just to elaborate a little bit on Thomas's introduction so that you, you kind of know um, who I am and where I'm approaching um, this, this discussion about remote learning from. Um, so I, I do teach in the clinics um, at Harvard Law School and we have um, a collaboration in our education law clinic between the law school and an organization in Boston called Massachusetts Advocates for Children, which some of you may be familiar with. And the focus of this collaboration is the issue of childhood trauma and its impacts on um, students and their learning. And um, so our work really is focused on bringing about what we call trauma sensitive schools. These are um, schools that understand the impacts of trauma on students and families and work to create whole school learning environments or school cultures that are safe and supportive and engender a sense of belonging and connectedness um, and care for every student in the building. So if that's your work, if that's the work you do every day, trying to create these whole school cultures, and then all of a sudden there's no school buildings anymore that students are attending, it presents a bit of a challenge. What, do, what does remote learning look like um, in a period like this, in an unprecedented period like this? And, um, and how do we go about trying to engender that same sense of connection and care and trauma sensitivity in this remote way that we would do um, if we were in school buildings together. So that's that's kind of the where I, I was thinking that this conversation could end up. Um, I wanted to say a couple more things by way of introduction, which is sort of how we work on this mission of creating uh, trauma sensitive schools where, where all students, including those who have had traumatic experiences can learn and thrive. Um, and so the first thing that we do is we work directly with individual students and families, where I should say at least the, the lawyers on the project do. We represent families in the special education system. Um, not all students who have experienced trauma have disabilities that qualify them for special education, but many do. And where that is the case, they have um, strong entitlements under state and federal law, and we can use those entitlements to help make schooling work better for those students and those families. And so that's what we do, and we teach law students how to do that, how to provide legal representation in special ed. 
The second thing that we do is we have former educators and uh, school psychologists and school social workers on our team who partner directly with schools and districts that desire to create trauma-sensitive schools and uh, provide uh, coaching, professional development, and um, we don't like to really use the word consultation, but, um, but, but provide some external support to schools and districts that want to create trauma-sensitive schools. And then the third thing that we do is we try to channel everything that we learn from individual students and families and their needs and everything we learn from the educators we partner with um, into the policy arena. So we do a lot of work at the State House down on Beacon Hill and at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education up in Malden um, to try to make sure that policymakers have the, the understanding that they need to provide educators the resources and knowledge and, and incentives to create trauma sensitive schools for all, for all students. So that's just a little bit about my, my work. Um, what I had thought we would do um, quickly is I do have um, just a small number of slides that kind of summarize the key points in the few readings that I um, shared with Thomas and that I believe he shared with all of you. Um, but you know, I recognize that everybody's very busy and you may not have done the readings or, or even if you did, um, you know, it might help to have a little refresher. So I certainly don't want to spend a lot of time, um, you know, repeating what some or all of you may have read, but what I thought I would do is put up some slides that kind of summarize the key points from the readings, and I would just might elaborate on some things that maybe are subtextual or, or some things that, um, that go beyond like what was in the document. Um, and then what I'd really like to do is get to a place where we can have a, a brief conversation or you can ask questions or um, you know, share what you're seeing. Um, I, of course, I don't know um, who many of you are, so I don't know what your roles are or how you might be connected to education or students and families, but to the extent you are, I would love to hear what you're encountering in your work. So what I'm gonna do quickly is share my screen, um, which is always a treacherous thing to try to do. Um, here we go. And then what that does is it moves everything around on my monitors. Let me get it back in place. Now, you should be seeing a purple slide. Thumbs up if that's what you're seeing. Okay, good. And we're, that's, that's, um, that's a good way to begin when the slide works. So that's just a, a title slide that tells you about me. Um, now I'm going to be able to click them, all right? Let's see, there we go. So first of all, we're in this period of remote learning. And one of the things that I think Thomas just mentioned is really critical, which is that, um, you know, as we know, the length of school closure in Massachusetts just got extended until the end of the school year. And so, I mean, that's just emblematic of the fact that um, this period is um, constantly evolving and the guidance that's coming from the department and, and how districts are, um, furthering their understanding of what they're supposed to be doing is all a constantly moving picture. It's constantly evolving. But how do we get to where we are now? Um, which is in a, in a very uncertain place. But how do we get here? Well, when schools started closing um, and it became clear that this was going to be something that was going to take place across the country, the federal um, Department of Education issued a guidance to states and to schools and to districts um, to try to clarify what their obligations were to students and families during this period of closure. And um, this is gonna really oversimplify what that guidance said, but basically what it said was, um, you really don't have to be doing anything. Um, certainly, um, if you're choosing to provide remote learning opportunities for regular education students, then you would have to also provide um, uh, learning opportunities uh, to students with disabilities, students who might have individualized education programs, but you don't have to do any of those things. We would encourage you to do them and it would be great if you did, but there's no obligation to provide um, remote learning for all students or if you, and if you don't do that, then you also do not have to provide um, any services to students with disabilities. And um, this was a really horrible thing to, to do because um, um, A, it, it really isn't consistent with special education law. Students who are receiving services under special education have an entitlement that exists regardless of whether schools are meeting physically in session or not. Um, and so to, to sort of absolve schools and districts of thinking that they had to do anything um, was really problematic and further problematic was um, this idea that like 
if you stop providing services for all students, you can also get out of your obligation to provide special education services because what that did was provide a perverse incentive to not give anything to anybody because then we also don't have things for students with disabilities. So it sort of put a lot on the backs of students with disabilities. Um, and so this was the, the federal guidance and you know, following suit, our State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education issued a statewide guidance to schools and districts in Massachusetts that was you know, largely consistent with, um, with the, the federal um, recommendations. Um, the advocates raised holy hell about this, both within our state and also nationally. And about two weeks into the school closures, uh, were successful at getting first Betsy DeVos's uh, department um, and then later our own state department of elementary and secondary education to reverse course and so the department the the uh, federal doe issued um, a clarifying or a supplemental fact statement not saying that they had gotten it wrong but clarifying that what they had meant to say was that um, in fact students on ieps are entitled to receive their free appropriate public education and schools and districts are obligated to do that and further, that you could not deny education to all students as a way of evading that legal obligation to, um, to serve students with disabilities. Um, what they had said initially and repeated in the um, clarifying guidance was that, um, that even though, or even if students didn't have their needs met during the period of school closure, they might be entitled to compensatory education upon a return to school. And so even that initial guidance, uh, the, the first one that we um, thought got it so wrong in so many ways, did get right um, that, um, that if uh, uh, students regressed or did not have their needs met during the period of school closure, they would presumptively be entitled to some form of additional compensatory education when, when uh, schools eventually reopen. Um, and they continue to reiterate that in, in this second round of guidances. So what you read was um, sort of the 2.0 versions of our state guidances on special education. And, and actually, I guess the, 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 the 1.0 version of the remote learning guidance for all students. But the, this FAQ uh, that was related to special education was sort of the, the take two. It was the revision that our State Department issued um, after, after um, the Federal Department changed its view. So that's kind of a, a little bit of background on how we got to the guidances that you read. So, um, so what, in terms of what this is going to look like in Massachusetts, or, or has been looking like it, um, let's just uh, sort of quickly put up some slides that summarize the guidances that I had you read. And the first thing that I would say is just to note the language here. These are framed as guiding principles and recommendations. They're not, in fact, the, the guidances explicitly state these, at least in terms of remote learning for general education students, these are not requirements per se, although some of the language says you must do this and you have an obligation to do this. Um, the language is really fuzzy. Um, leaving schools and districts feeling like, well, we know we've got to do something, but we're not really sure exactly what we've got to do. Um, and there's, there's a lot of leeway and there's a lot of variability uh, in terms of what schools and districts are doing. So this, this language about guiding principles and recommendations um, are really meant to signal um, that, that school districts are going to have a lot of discretion about what they do. So the guiding principles um, are sort of the ideas that should be guiding how we think about what remote learning should look like. And so the guidance says that um, we want to think about students' needs in very holistic ways, prioritizing safety and well-being, um, but also um, paying special attention to equity concerns that are going to arise during this time. Um, I think it's really important that, that equity be there front and center. Um, if you read the documents, what you saw is that there were some groups of students that were particularly mentioned with respect to equity considerations, namely students with disabilities and English language learners, but other groups of students that we might imagine uh, might encounter inequitable access during this time that were not explicitly mentioned. Um, and so I find that um, interesting and um, problematic. Sec uh, finally, um, a real prioritizing of maintaining connections. And you're going to see how we've, um, in terms of our trauma-sensitive response to this, really um, focused on this as well. This idea that it's very important to maintain the relationship to the school and to the adults in the school. That's got to be a big priority during this time. 
Um, there are also some guiding principles about what remote learning models are supposed to look like. They're really careful to manage everybody's expectations and say, you know, look, remote learning can't possibly look the same or, or deliver the same kinds of things that in-person learning can, and so we should understand that from the get-go. Um, there's an obligation. So here there is the word obligation is used, even though we have this language about guiding principles and recommendations. There's, then there's this stronger language about obligation. So you can see where there's, there's tension here. Uh, but an obligation to engage in meaningful and productive learning. And I think what's important about this language is that prior to the new guidance, um, many districts had been doing enrichment activities, um, which in their you know, worst iteration was really nothing more than busy work, you know, sending home some worksheets, some packets, but without any guidance, without any instruction. And, you know, you're, it's up to you whether you want to do it or not. We're just, just giving you some packets if you would like. Um, and what I think what this says is, you know, mere enrichment packets, busy work is not enough. This has got to be meaningful and productive learning that students have an opportunity to engage in while school is closed. And then finally, remote instruction or remote learning does not necessarily mean online learning. So, of course, at Harvard, we've switched to remote learning as well, and it does mean online learning. I mean, every class is on Zoom, and we spend, the, if it's a two-hour class, we're on Zoom for two hours holding class. This says that, you know, in, in public schools, this is not what it means. Um, remote learning can mean lots and lots of different things. Being logged in online in a, a group situation, as we're in right now, is just one way that remote learning can happen. Those were the guiding principles, and here are some of the specific recommendations. So in terms of the model of remote learning, the rule of thumb is that students should expect to engage in uh, learning for about half the length of the regular school day. So if we assume that, you know, a typical school day is six to seven hours, we're talking about three to three and a half hours a day, the student should be engaged in some kind of learning, some kind of educational work. Rather than teaching new skills, the focus should really be on reinforcing skills that have already been learned during this school year and then helping students apply and deepen those skills, but not necessarily teaching new skills or new content. And then just making really clear that individual experiences will vary. There's no promise that every student is going to get exactly the same thing or that it will look exactly the same. In terms of the definition and scope of what remote learning means, this is just sort of a, a elaboration on the guiding principle that we just went over, which is that it's going to look lots of different ways. Um, there's a wide variety of learning opportunities that can be considered remote learning and many, many different tools, not all online tools. The packets are okay. You can still send home a packet uh, as one of the many things that you do. That would be remote learning. It just has to be meaningful and, and real and, um, you know, not just busy work. Um, in terms of the components of a student's schedule, um, there's got to be an opportunity to connect multiple times per week with at least one adult in the school building. What that means, like an opportunity to connect, is not really defined. Um, I think many of us would hope that that would be some kind of face-to-face -face, um, uh, or at least over the phone, some kind of real-time interaction. Um, but I know that many districts are doing things like, um, you know, responding to chat rooms or having a teacher um, sort of go on Google, some of the Google platform and, um, you know, um, sort of answer questions in a chat or respond by email, but not necessarily a face-to-face -face or a voice-to-voice -voice, um, interaction. Um, multiple hours a day of time should be, should be spent with educator-directed uh, learning or initiatives, um, not, um, not all self-directed and not necessarily directed by a parent, but, but the educator should be uh, directing the learning for multiple hours each day. And there should be opportunities for physical activity and enrichment along with the academic learning. And finally, in terms of feedback and grading, like teachers should be providing feedback on student work to the extent practicable. This is another change. You know, these enrichment activities that were happening during the first few weeks of school closure, there was no expectation that teachers would provide any feedback on that work or even look at it. It was really just something for you to do if you wanted to. Um, so that has changed. There's a recommendation that um, grades be uh, a transition to credit, no credit. Um, for all students, and that before a no credit would ever be given, the department wants people to think really carefully about the equity considerations that might be coming into play and why it might not have been possible for that student to engage um, in the remote learning opportunities offered to the same extent as other students. <clears throat> so that's the basic overview from our department um, here in Massachusetts with uh, an acknowledgement that there are other 
specific questions that the department has had to address about things like MCAS and whether or not it would take place, it's not taking place, what the implications of that would be for students who are graduating, um, and, and many other considerations. But this is the basic template that sort of is meant to communicate to schools and districts what they're supposed to be doing during this time. In terms of special education, um, students with disabilities, um, the main thing that this FAQ um, is meant to communicate is that unlike the initial set of guidances, which got it wrong, students with disabilities do have a right to receive their free appropriate public education during this period of school closure. Um, many disability related modifications and services can be effectively provided online. So I have clients right now who are um, receiving rules-based reading instruction, like the Wilson Reading Program, online, a uh, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, with their special education teacher, students who are receiving speech therapy. Um, my own daughter, um, who is four years old, has an IEP. She's not enrolled in school yet, but um, you can get special ed starting at age three, and she gets uh, physical therapy. And she's going to be getting a Zoom, uh, a half an hour Zoom with her uh, physical therapist every other week and doing, you know, activities in our living room, you know, or whatever. We, it hasn't happened yet, uh, but there's been a promise that we'll begin. And so, so a lot of the services that students get in their IEPs, you know, can be provided in some form or fashion um, remotely. And, um, and there's an expectation now that that happen. Um, any educational opportunities offered to the general student population must be made accessible to those with disabilities. So in addition to whatever special things you're supposed to get in your IEP, whatever services you're entitled to, um, if there are things being offered to the whole class, um, you also have a right to access those things and for those things to be made accessible to you. Um, and then finally, you know, the, the, the FAQ makes clear that FAPE will look different. Um, so um, to use the physical therapy example, I mean, doing that over Zoom is, is great and, and we're going to really look forward to that. But of course, it won't be the same as when she's going to a school and in the gym and they have all kinds of manipulatives and balls and act equipment and um, activities that she can do in the school. So parents need to understand that it will look different, but an effort has to be made and you have to do the best you can um, under the circumstances that we have. Um, in addition to this sort of substantive guarantee of FAPE, um, there's also a lot of questions about procedures and timelines. Um, the special education laws are very procedure heavy. And so what are those, what are those deadlines and timelines going to look like when school staff um, is dispersed just as much as families are? Um, so the first thing is that every student is supposed to have a remote learning plan where the district kind of says, here's how we're going to adapt your IEP for remote learning. And here's what you're going to be getting and here's what your schedule is going to be. Um, one of the things that the advocates had to work hard on was ensuring that this remote learning plan would not supersede the underlying IEP. Um, and so for that reason, parents don't have to consent to what the remote learning plan is. The remote learning plan is just um, a way to implement what the underlying IEP is. And the reason that's important is because we wouldn't want the services to get watered down for remote learning and then for that remote learning plan to be the operative document going forward when school comes back in session because then that would have resulted in a loss presumably of what had been in that initial IEP. So the initial IEP remains the guiding document. Um, the remote learning plan is just sort of saying like here's how we're going to implement it during these unique circumstances. Um, both IEP meetings and um, legal proceedings at our state appeal agency, the Bureau of Special Education Appeals, can happen virtually. Um, and I've now had an opportunity to participate for my own clients in several virtual IEP meetings um, and have another one scheduled next week. Initially, schools were saying that they couldn't do this, it would be too hard, there were too many confidentiality implications, um, but the department has advised them that if the parents want to meet virtually, you should find a way to do so. Um, uh, in terms of um, timelines for evaluating students and holding annual reviews of their IEPs, um, this is still somewhat up in the air. There's a major push happening at the federal level and it involves the CARES Act. Um, there was a piece of um, uh, a component of the CARES Act which said that Secretary DeVos would be able to come back to Congress within 30 days of the Act's passage and ask for waivers, the, the authority to grant waivers to states in terms of implementation of, of IEP timelines if she felt um, after waiting for 30 days that that were necessary. And so there's a tremendous push at the federal level 
um, from many states and schools and districts to get her to waive or to ask Congress to waive um, the, all of the, the deadlines and timelines in special ed. We think this would be a real problem for students and families. Uh, at the same time, we're recognizing that it's hard to perform and meet those timelines given current circumstances. So a pr proposal has been put forth um, that's sort of called the good faith compromise, which is that the timelines will remain in effect, but that if a district can't meet them for some reason, as long as they're operating in good faith, who knows what that would mean, but it would have to be defined. But if they can show that they were operating in good faith to meet the timelines, um, then they would not be held accountable or, or liable if they fail to meet them. So there's sort of like a spectrum of, of possibility here. One is just that the timelines remain in force and effect as if, as if nothing had changed. The other end of the spectrum would be that they're waived and abolished for some period of time um, until school reopens. And then there's been this compromise proposal that's been put forth in the middle, which says, yeah, let's keep the timelines in place, but let's give districts a little bit of breathing room because we recognize how hard it is to comply with those timelines during this period. And then I already sort of mentioned this idea that when school's back in session, um, there's likely to be many families who are entitled to compensatory education because of things that their students did not receive um, during the period of school closure. So in terms of ongoing challenges, like what are we seeing on the ground? And when I say we, I mean not only those in my, uh, on my team, but also we're plugged into the Legal Services Network in Massachusetts. In fact, I co-lead with a colleague, um, a group of all the legal services attorneys across the state who do education work. And so we're in constant contact with them, hearing about what they're seeing with their clients um, and, and in districts across the state. Um, we also, um, as Massachusetts Advocates for Children, operate a statewide helpline that any parent can call, um, not just during a period of school closure, but ever, at any point in time, if they have questions about their child's education. And so we're trying to keep our, our, you know, our feet on the ground and our ears um, open and trying to understand what's happening out there. And here's some of what we're seeing. First is just that there's tremendous variability in what schools and districts and I see this even in my own small caseload. I have one um, client who's in a district where you know, we've already had two virtual IEP meetings. They've sent the remote learning plan. Um, I mentioned the student is getting his, his Wilson reading program and speech and counseling and each class is meeting um, two times a week online, um, getting a lot. I have other clients who literally have yet to hear anything from their child's IEP team and have not received a remote learning plan and really nothing is happening. Um, and so, so that's hard, that's really hard. And it's hard to know where, what, what places are doing it well and what places are not doing it well and to sort of catalog all of that. In addition, tremendous variability among families themselves. I mean, um, you know, families are vastly different places in terms of their ability to access um, what it is that their school district might be offering. And so um, even in this case that I have where the district is offering quite a bit, really the only reason that the student is able to um, actively partake of it is because sadly his mother was furloughed from her job midway through. And so initially she was very worried that the district was going to offer stuff and she wouldn't be there um, the, the child's father works at home, but he's working and not able to sit there at the Chromebook and help the student log in and access his services. Um, and so the, you know, the, the silver lining of her being furloughed is that now she is there and can provide that structure. But, um, but I mean, you, should, you wouldn't want to have to choose between those two things. So, um, so families are in all different places. Um, and as you can well imagine, there are many families that have multiple students who are all uh, maybe in different schools in the same district and, and tremendous variability even within districts in terms of how well individual schools are, are doing during this time. And so really hard to manage all of this variability and to even understand it. Also, the ability to access the remote instruction is a real problem. And so we're seeing access problems in terms of both hardware like the type of technology that people have. Uh, many of our clients only have smartphones. Um, and it's actually common, I was just on the phone yesterday with some folks out in Western Mass, uh, Springfield area, and many of their clients um, are using um, not, uh, they don't have smartphones, they, they're referring to them as Obama phones. And I have never heard that um, phrase before, but I, I'm assuming it must be phones that people were able to access or get through some kind of um, initiative under the Obama administration, but they're flip phones. 
and they have limited minutes and limited data capacity, and that's what they're having to use to do anything remote. They don't have a computer, they don't have a tablet, they don't have a smartphone, and so how do you do remote learning if all you have is an Obama phone? Um, secondly, you know, access to connectivity, to Wi-Fi. Um, this is not um, something that can be taken for granted for many of our families, and so it really can inhibit a student's ability to partake of remote instruction. And then thirdly, even if you have the right device and you have Wi-Fi, if parents are not being given the knowledge and capacity or the student isn't to actually know how to log in and utilize the remote learning tools that the school is providing, I mean, the access might not be that meaningful. Um, in addition, language access is, is a huge issue even before this period of closure, but even more so now. And so the advocates have sent, uh, Mass Advocates for Children, one of the lead authors, a letter to DESE making several recommendations about what needs to be done to improve language access during this time. And this is are just some of the recommendations that have been made. You know, a centralized telephonic uh, interpreting system. I mean, there's just simply not a, a system in place to make translators and interpreters available for these meetings that are supposed to be happening, or of course, for the instruction that students are accessing. Um, a clearinghouse of instructional materials that are translated into many languages so that educators who don't already have these materials can go to a central place and obtain them and then make them available to uh, families and students. Um, immediate direct communication. Um, you know, we're now six weeks into the closure and there are some families that have still not been contacted by their school or district because of the lack of, of language ability. And so just really um, emphasizing that, that it must, this is urgent, you know, this, this is really urgent that they figure this out. Um, and um, the, the letter also asks for a bunch of additional technical guidance from the department so the schools and districts know what they're supposed to be doing. One thing that we saw and really continue to see, but more so in the early weeks among all of the legal services attorneys is uh, we thought that our intake hotlines would be, you know, blowing up with families calling and being very concerned and that wasn't happening and it's still it's starting to happen but not uh, not as much i suspect that we know school's not coming back this year families will be much more urgent about wanting to figure out what's going to happen between now and the end of the year um but we weren't seeing that and even when we reached out to our individual clients it was often the lawyer who was more concerned that education wasn't happening in a robust way than the families were. And really the reason why is because so many of our clients have more basic needs. I mean, they're worried about paying their rent. They're worried about losing their job. They're worried about getting food on the table. They're worried about being sick or possibly getting sick uh, and all other kinds of things. And if you just think about Maslow's hierarchy, for example, I mean, education isn't the first thing. And so, so many of our clients are struggling in so many more basic ways that they weren't you know, necessarily reaching out and wanting to prioritize the remote learning and instruction. Um, and then finally, just this loss of connection to school. I've done many cases over my career of school avoidance, where the reason I'm brought in by the family is because the child has stopped going to school for disability related reasons, or it could be for bullying, uh, mental health reasons, all kinds of things. And what I've learned from all of those cases is that the longer you're out of school, the harder it is to go back. Um, the harder it is to reconnect with those relationships and to feel that the school is a place um, of meaning for you and a place where you belong um, and a place that you want to be. And so particularly for these families who aren't being communicated with, um, the danger of this loss of connection is really important because we can't assume um, the kids are going to rush back to school in September, even if school reopens. Um, and so we need to be really, really concerned about this. Um, I know we're, we're really getting close to the end. I'm just going to put up here um, some of the key points from our, um, the, the, the document that our project produced about really prioritizing keeping connections strong and focusing on relationships and safety as a way to make sure that remote learning that's being offered is done in a trauma sensitive way. Um, I haven't said a lot about what trauma sensitivity means. It's, it's a, a term of art that I haven't defined, but uh, I'll, I'll let you sort of go off of your intuitions. Um, it basically just means that, that safety considerations and relationship considerations come first. Um, you know, learning really can't happen if, unless it's, it's happening in the context of a relationship where a child feels secure and cared for and respected. And those connections are just as important. In fact, I would say even more important now um, in, where, where students are physically separated from their school communities um, than during the periods where they're in school. Um, so these are 
I want to just say where these points come from. We um, convened in a virtual open house. We, we opened our Zoom for four hours one day and allowed um, trauma sensitive educators who we had partnered with for a long time um, to join at their uh, availability and just tell us like, okay, you're, you're out there, you're in the trenches, you're trying to do this. How, what are you thinking about? What questions are on your mind? How are you trying to maintain this amazing um, school culture that you had created in your building? Um, while you're reaching out to families remotely. And these were the things that they stressed as most important to them. Um, and so the document is just us trying to put in writing the things that they told us, um, but really making sure that you connect to all families. I mean, every single family. I mean, they're literally, if they hadn't been able to get in touch with the family, they found the address, they maintained social distance, but they went out to the home. They tried to say, look, we're bringing you a Chromebook, we're bringing you instruction, like we just wanna know that you're okay. Um, really going above and beyond, um, really focusing on language access and, and uh, responding to this concern about um, families having more basic needs by making the school a place that could help address those. Not that the school is going to deliver all the resources, but by giving teachers lists of locally available resources so that when they reach out to the family, they're in a position to say, oh my gosh, you don't have this, you don't have that, here's the place to call, here's the number. Um, then the school becomes a way to get those basic needs met, um, or at least to assist with that. Um, and, and that can make the school appear more relevant to the family in a time like this. So um, all of this is really um, with an eye toward looking ahead to reentry. Um, you know, th these things are important to do, not just for the time being, to make sure that kids are getting their education, but, um, but to maintain this connection so that they will return. And so that families will want to um, bring their students back to school and reconnect with the school. Um, we're really, we're really worried about losing students and about losing families. So um, I've been talking more than I intended, but um, let me just kind of stop. And uh, I know that we're set to go till 4:45, and um, I'll look to to Thomas about uh, about this. But I mean, I'm certainly happy to remain a few minutes longer to talk or answer any questions. And, and of course, anybody who needs to go can do so at any time. So I'm going to um, be quiet for a while and, and hear your thoughts. I know. I, know. I think that we can definitely go longer. Um, I think for anyone who wants to speak, you might be uh, um, automatically muted, so you just have to unmute yourself. If you're one of the folks who has dialed in, um, it might be a bit more difficult for you to unmute, but there should be an option for that as well. And I'll just chime in and say, thank you so much. This has been extraordinarily, the overview, extraordinarily helpful. I just wanna call attention. There's at least one question so far on the chat. Uh, from Laura Tavares, um, which you know, I invite her to act, give actual voice to. Laura, do you want to chime in with your? Sure. Hi, Carrie and Michael. Thank you so much. Um, I work with Facing History and ourselves, so we don't mm -hmm. deal immediately with students, but we're supporting a lot of teachers and schools who do. And um, we've been doing a lot of support around remote learning, but are kind of starting to pivot now to think about um, what will schools need in the fall um, or whenever back to school is for them. Yeah. And so, you know, what you said about um, it being harder to go back the longer you're out really resonated and is something we've been worrying about. And I wonder what sort of the policies and practices are that might help to um, recreate that sense of belonging or that sense of meaning that has become um, more tenuous. You know, I think what we learned from some of, um, some of our trauma sensitive schools and districts um, is that um, knowing your kids well enough to know which adult in the building is the one that they really have the strong relationship with and making sure that relationship remains. Um, I mean, I don't know what it means to have the adult who's reaching out to make a connection with you be the one who you don't have a good relationship with even when school's in session. So if, if you know your community well enough and you know where those, those stable relationships are, making sure that that's the priority first, I think is one way. Um, I think when we think about connecting the student to like the whole school or the whole community, that feels really daunting. But it could be the pull of just that one really important relationship that can keep that connection intact. 
And so thinking about which relationship that should be. I think that also applies to peers. And I didn't, um, the, the trauma sensitive educators didn't say as much about that to us, but the example that comes to my mind is that I have this one client who this was before um, really the remote learning started in earnest. And um, he, um, they were at least having their homeroom advisory online every day, but he was not logging into the homeroom because um, he was a special education student. And so while the other students in the homeroom went to all of their classes together throughout the rest of the day, he didn't. He went to the homeroom and then he went to his special ed classes. So his mom was trying to get him to log in today. They call it an advisory every day, but he didn't want to go to the advisory because he didn't know those kids. So he was staying up late playing games with the three friends from school that he had. And that was his way of maintaining social connection. And I just thought to myself, well, gosh, if those are the three peer relationships that he needs to maintain, like couldn't the school, why does it have to be in a video game at midnight? I mean, when you should be sleeping, why couldn't that be something where you create a, a Zoom group during the day for those four kids to get together and you give them a question to discuss or something, but, but you're keeping the, the peer relationships that matter intact, in not just any old peer relationships. So I guess that's some of what I would say in response to your question, but thank you for the work you're doing um, and for um, you know, thinking ahead to reentry because it's really important. I'm gonna, what I had done is just typed in um, our website, um, which I realized I didn't put in the slides, but um, anybody who's interested in the issue of, of trauma sensitivity or trauma sensitive schools um, can visit traumasensitiveschools.org and there's you know, a lot more information. Um, Michael, I also see a question on the chat. What should we be thinking about with our very young students in this remote learning model? Yeah, that's a good, a really good question. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I, I hadn't really thought about this until I heard that question, but I realized that most of the clients that I happen to be working with at this particular moment are not on the younger side, their middle or high school students. And so I don't think I've, um, you never really sort of grapple with a question like this until you're facing it for a particular child. And I'm realizing in this moment that I haven't done that um, uh, with younger kids other than my own daughter, who is not a good example because she's not really in school yet. She just gets this little uh, sort of physical therapy service. But, um, you know, I think um, one of the things that I have noticed is that I think even with her, um, the attention span of a younger child is so different when it comes to engaging in a medium like this um, than being in a classroom. And so, I mean, I'm not an educator of, of young children. Um, and so I'm just sort of speaking intuitively here, but I could well imagine that, um, that the lack of a classroom structure is going to make it really hard for younger students to retain their attention, maintain their attention and be focused on whatever the instruction is. And I think actually the thing that I have um, done some thinking about it and for colleagues talking about it is that what this does is put a tremendous burden on the parent in a way that isn't as true with older students to be the one there structuring the learning um, for the younger child. And I guess this sort of gets to the point that's uh, still up on the slide here that says um, supporting families to help students learn. A, a way in which I, I haven't really seen any of the districts um, that I've encountered in my cases um, coming, um, coming through is in figuring out how to provide training and supports for, for, for parents to understand how to be that. I mean, parents can't be the teacher, but there are certain are there tips? Are there um, ways that they should be thinking about how to help structure the ch child's attention and time so that the teacher who's online can actually be engaging with them and the child can be learning? So I think more supports to help parents think about how to be that structure would be something that would be particularly important for younger students. That's really helpful. Thank you, Michael. I can speak directly to the fact that I have a, a fourth grader at home who, who is special needs and is dyslexic. She has a hard time reading, but a lot of the whole schedule is online now. And so just that essential support from a parent, and we're both working, <laughs> uh, to read her assignments and get on, it's, it's, it's challenging for sure. We're really in it, in it with the ups and downs. And of course, you know, the other, the flip side of that is so many educators have their kids at home now too. And so they're having to manage 
um, their own their child remote learning and then the remote instruction that they're providing as an educator and um, so their their plate is very very full right now 100 um, percent for sure are there other other questions that people uh, people have I see most uh, Anyone want to raise a hand if they have a question before we? Michael, you may find it interesting to scroll the chat um, after the fact and note that there are many people here who have um, a strong interest and experience, relevant experience, but also expertise in working close, closely with schools. And I, I see um, a lot of people who have just strong connections to this work that you're doing. and. Um, I, I hope they've appreciated this as much as much as I have in terms of giving an overview of of the current issues and challenges and sort of breaking down some of what's happening, some of the guidance, federal and state level, and the particular challenges that we're having in math. Well, thanks. I, I certainly will. Well, I um, usually the chat saves. Um, is that I don't know if I'll have access to it. Maybe I should copy and paste it, but I, I would. Um, love to scroll through. I mean, one of the things I would also just like to make space for is if anybody um, wants to, I mean, given the connections that you mentioned, Carrie, I mean, is there anybody who maybe doesn't have a question, but rather a perspective that they'd like to share? Um, um, I feel like in many ways, we're kind of just scratching the surface and probably there's lots I'm leaving out or not addressing and, and I bet somebody else might want to, you know, supplement what's been said so far. Raising my hand, hi. Um, I'm I'm interested in, and you didn't mention this because it's a kind of on a tangent, but the economic loss on in terms of parents with children with um, significant disabilities, such as those children who are on the autism spectrum or have behavioral um, issues that accompany um, learning disabilities. Uh, you know, those parents who are in our situation who are also home or furloughed or not working at all, um, their time and their actual energies being um, fully taken by the needs of the child um, is, is really going to be a significant piece of the equity issues that we talk about going forward, I think. Just wanted to ha have your thought on that too, please. Yeah, I think that's, I'm so glad you're raising that. You know, even when school's in session, you know, over the years, I've um, been doing this work for 16 years now. So I've had many, many clients over that time. And have certainly had clients, even when school is in session, who lose their jobs because um, they're having to be called to school repeatedly, either for IEP meetings or for discipline hearings or for what have you. Um, and so, um, you know, this set of circumstances is making that problem even more acute because, <clears throat> um, you know, there, there are some parents who, you know, who might have the opportunity to continue working, but because they're also now full-time um, childcare, um, the strain that that's going to place on their ability to be a wage earner and to keep working um, during this time is going to be even worse. And in fact, um, you know, we're, we're feeling this in, in my household because, you know, as I said, my daughter isn't in school yet, but she was attending a daycare, a family daycare. And the, the analog agency to the Department of Education that, that sort of regulates and manages childcare, the Department of Early Education and Care, has also just extended the closure of daycares until, I think, June 29th or something. And so, you know, for any parent, I'm thinking both about the, the daycare provider, you know, who's, who's now not going to have those students returning, but also those parents, um, my daughter's uh, friends, who um, may have been just holding out hope that come May 4th, they were going to get to have daycare back so that they could keep working. And of course, now that's not going to happen. Um, so I don't, I don't have anything smart to say about it other than just to, to um, affirm your point that um, this is going to be huge. This is going to be huge. And I mean, just add into the mix the fact that 
many of the public um, funds that Congress has appropriated, whether it's unemployment or whether it's the small business loans or any of these things, are, they're not flowing to families in a fast way. It, it's, it's very um, muddled, it's very disorganized. And so um, just because the money has been appropriated doesn't mean that it's, it's flowing into the pocketbooks of, of families. And, um, and I see that happening all over the place. All right, folks, are there any other questions, comments, concerns, perspectives, anything like that? I'm scrolling through just to look at all the videos to make sure I don't miss anyone. I don't see anything. Um, so with that, I will thank Professor Gregory for joining us and leading this conversation. I think everyone very happy to be here and hear the knowledge that you have and expertise that you're willing to share. And I thank all of y'all for joining us here, for the conversation, sharing your thoughts and ideas as well. And I will invite you to join us next Thursday at 4 o'clock with Claire King. She will lead a conversation asking what do we stand for in this crisis, discussing how students at her institution have had to sort of step up to the plate and look at the ways in which they are surviving in the midst of COVID-19 and its impact, particularly on folks living in New York City. Um, so if you're joining us for that, we'll have that in our newsletter next Monday as well. And with that being said, I think Professor Gregory left his email and some materials from the Trauma Sensitive Policy Initiative in the chat. Um, I will send that on a follow-up email to all of you as well. So again, thank you all for being here. Have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you.